Aloha no. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. We're about to get to know a woman who's comfortable in both designer clothing and puka pants. She's devoted to her big family and her sizable business. She's articulate, eloquent in both standard English and pidgin. Who is she? Shaw Thompson, a lifelong learner and high achiever. We're about to sit down and talk with her. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. With her husband Jack, Shaw Thompson owns and operates Tihati Productions, a family business in the entertainment industry. She's also a mother of 12 grown children, some of them Hanai, a Polynesian tradition of adoption. She's proud that each of her kids has attended college and that she herself has recently earned a bachelor's degree. Proud because her story begins in a public housing project in Kalihi. I'm a product of the tenement housing and um, it was quite different from today. It was the kind of time where if you ran out of sugar, you could go next door and borrow a cup of sugar and, and uh, pay it back when the welfare check came. Yeah. How many people in your family? Uh, my mother raised eight of us, um, four boys and four girls. And where were you in the mix? Number three from the top. So that means you helped a lot with the other kids? I, I did, I did. For us, um, everything was sharing and caring. How tight was the finance? Boy. I'll tell you what, it, it's a miracle what she did to raise all of us with, without uh, so little, so little, because she was not a professional woman. Um, I used to tease her and say, Mama, you're a peasant woman, because she had all of us children and she never really held a job. So um, the rest of us did. I mean, we all knew we had to help out. So we went to so work. So as soon as you could, you started as earning money? As soon as you could. I mean, we babysat, we mowed the lawn, we, um, we worked in the cannery. That was my first real paycheck kind of job. What did you spend your free time doing? You went to school, you tried to earn money. You know, we babysat, I mean, one another. I, I took care, help with the younger ones. Um, I remember helping my mother's kid sister take care of her children. I was all of 11 years old and you already helped. You helped, that's why I love children so much. And if you did anything else, you cleaned the house. My mother made sure of that. And my daughters now, I mean, they all have their college degrees, but they would say, Mama would say, if you have any worth, if you're worth your salt, you had to learn how to clean the toilet, you had to know how to fight, and you had to have a college degree. What about the advice of your mother to you kids? You know, my mom, um, she allowed for her kid sister to help raise me, who's really one of my most favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, we call her Punadia, and she lives in Waimanalo. The importance to them was that we would just be good people, be honest, you know. Um, no shame in being poor, shame in being dishonest. And so that, that's kind of the way I grew up. You didn't feel shame when you had to wear hand-me-downs and uh, same dress or, or clothes over and over? No, and the reason I didn't was because the two ingredients I got from Kalihi was uh, compassion. I knew we were the underdogs and, I, uh, and, and humor. Anything that might make us less or make us ashamed, we made fun of. My God, we made fun of each other a lot, and we laughed a lot, and we laughed loud. And so that was kind of the remedy of, eh, I don't care. You know? And I grew up thinking that, like, I don't care who was bigger, smarter, richer than I was. I was okay. I was okay. That you helped know? you a lot, didn't that it? That sure did. And that, you learned that from Kalihi. Somebody puts you down and, eh, you know, I could do something better than they could. I knew I could. Did you grow up feeling stigmatized by welfare? Um, I think so. I think so. I didn't realize it till later, but in the housing, what was important, I don't know how this is going to sound, but what was important is you got to know how to beef, quite you frankly. You can beef? <laughs> you can beef? Yeah, you man. so elegant? Yeah, man. <laughs> or at least I used to a lot. Um, and you know, when you come from a large family, nobody wants to beef with you, because in the housing, families fight families. I mean, I know it sounds uh, in basilical, but we did. I mean, that was. Did you, you know, beef boys too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the boys didn't want to take me on, though. I had brothers, big brothers, and they'd back you up. Oh gosh, it was silly. Today it's silly. Um, wasn't silly then, though. I mean, you know, we did. 
crazy stuff. He fought over things that weren't important, you know. He called me when stink name was something. It was silly. Um, when you were a song leader, they were known to be the... Um, the cute ones, the, thank you. The prettiest <laughs> and the most social. Were you also very social? I think I was, and I think that was part of um, um, standing up, uh, being recognized, because I think that I, I saw so many people from the housing being pushed on the side, maybe not being able to express themselves or knowing, oh, they're from the other side of the tracks. And so I think I deliberately did that. Did you grow up with uh, standard English in your house or not? No. Oh, All no. pigeon? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you learned it in school? TV? Uh, you know, I must have, I must have mimicked people because um, I never studied in high school. I was a terrible student. Um, and I think affiliation, I think my travels a a as a dancer, I think traveling the world allowed me to meet others that spoke differently from me and I learned well. But the funniest thing is that you never forget because a couple months ago, uh, four of my girlfriends from Farrington, we graduated together, came over to the house. I hadn't seen them in a couple, oh, maybe more than a couple years. I hope they see this. And we, they spent the night, my husband was out of town, and we all slept on the floor in my living room. And I mean, you wanna talk about laugh. We got to make fun of one another because after you get older, um, you realize you're not all that anyway. And so you can talk the truth about which boys you liked and pretended not to like or who you beefed and who you, and who you beat and, 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 and how we even had run-ins with one another because mm -hmm. we were either hiding something or we didn't want to be uh, perceived as what you perceived me to be. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a wonderful evening. We ended with prayer and hugs, but not before we made terrible fun of one another. Now, what was the most telling thing you heard about yourself? That I couldn't sing, the nerve. We would do three, four part harmony and the one girl, Phyllis Rodriguez said, eh, you could never sing. And I said, shut up. She said, yeah, we'd always have to start again because you'd follow somebody else's key next to you, you know? Was she right? Yeah. I think so. I think so. I, I think so. I was the bossy one that said, no, no, just sing it that way. Sounded great. Just keep singing, you know. But the things that we didn't forget was um, we had one of our real leaders. She won shot put one year at Farrington. And it was all about being strong. And, and so she was our leader. Her name was um, Laverne Biven. We called her Beanie. She passed away. But before she did, uh, before she died of cancer, we went to the hospital and Phyllis brought out her guitar and, and, and we sang four part harmony for her and we sang the song that um, three of us won at a talent contest one night at Farrington. We sang that again and I mean, I sobbed because I thought it was like, a, this was a gift we were giving to her. She was dying and she still had the sweetest voice of all of us. And um, that is one of the memories I will hold close to my heart as I get older and, um, and remember that there were good times they were good times. Shaw Thompson is both gracious and grateful as she describes the direction her life has taken. You have a very successful business. You built your wealth. How do you look back at your days in Kalihi Valley Homes and at Farrington? And have they interfered with relationships? Has your success interfered with relationships? In the beginning, because Kalihi kids think you're, um, you think you're all that when you have to leave them for a little while. But in the long run, uh, we, we've all come back together. Um, and, and it might sound tacky to some people, but for me, it was my faith as a Christian that brought me through the real difficult times of, um, of being so poor and, uh, and wanting to achieve and not being able to and feeling less. You know, you just gotta swallow your pride, you were less. You know, we were always hungry, Leslie. We were always hungry, I was always hungry. And so maybe that was it. Maybe I thought, you know, I'm never gonna let that happen to my kids and it never did. What do you remember you wanted the most? If there, what was out of your grasp that you couldn't have and you always thought, I wanna get, when I ever have money, I'm gonna get that one day. It might have been education. It might have been education because I went back in my old age, but I, I think it was education and it was because I didn't realize it until I got older and, and having a successful company, I was asked to sit on many boards and they all had magnificent degrees and I thought, 
geez, you know, wow, there must be something I, 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 I don't have. I, I, I should go and, and try to get this. And I finally did. <laughs> what was Farrington like? I, I imagine it was, it's a lot different today, but what was it like then? You know, I sent all my kids to private schools, um, Kamehameha, Punahou, St. Louis. But for Farrington, I was so proud to come from Farrington because at Farrington, I saw decent, good kids. I saw boys that didn't wear black jackets and didn't have a ton of pomade on their hair and, and, and guys that were that became like my brothers. They, they, they weren't all into swearing and fighting, they weren't. And so for me, Farrington was the first stepping stone to being somebody, if you will. Farrington gave me what I thought was class because fair was fair at Farrington. You studied hard, you, you learned. Um, Farrington will always be special in my heart. Farrington was the first real dignified place for me. So didn't think of sending your kids to Farrington later though. And I didn't later because I knew that they would get a jump start more than I did, you know. I made sure they knew that education was important. Nobody told me education was important. It wasn't to my parents. They weren't educated. They, um, they just knew hard work and that's what we all did. In high school, mm -hmm. you met your, hus your husband-to-be. Yes. How did that happen? Oh, I thought he was I thought he was Mahu because he was a gentleman with manners and I only knew guys that, you know, I, I knew just tough guys. My brothers are all tough. And, but he was a gentleman. He spoke well and he tucked his shirt in and he wore loafers. And I, I thought this guy, you know, and, and he tells a story of he thought, ew, what kind of girl has a laugh that loud? So we really didn't hit it off. You know. This was what year at Farrington? He was a senior and I was a junior. He, it was 1964. And I thought, oh, what kind of Samoan is this? Um, and it turned out where we, we started having group. We never dated. It was just group people. I mean, you didn't even hold hands in those days in public. You didn't hold hands. So we didn't. We were friends. And um, his parents were going to move back to the islands. And I thought, and he told me that, and I thought to myself, well, what's going to happen to you? You know, you're, you're 21 now. <laughs> Are you going back home to where he's from? He's from a little atoll in the South Pacific. And, and he was going back, and I said, oh, well, shouldn't we be thinking about marriage? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sank me for the rest of my 42 <laughs> years of marriage. He told the children, I asked him to marry him, and boy, I had to live with that. <laughs> no. <laughs> You said he was very handsome. I, 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 I remember yes. you saying this. Yes. Do you still think he's handsome? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in a month, we will have been married for 42 years. And, um, and, and you say you're, you're different from each other. Oh. How are you different and why does oh. it work? I think that that man has far too many meetings. He wants to meet about the last meeting. You know, I, I'm, and he thinks I do things too quickly. I will decide in three hours what takes him three days, or I will do three days what takes him three weeks. And, and the kids will, will make fun of us till today. They did a skit at one of our anniversary parties because they cannot believe there is any similarity between the two of us. How could we have been happily married all these years? Because we'll see something and I will say, this is beautifully black. And he will say, oh no, it's white. <laughs> We're that different. So by the grace of God, we have been happily married for 42 years. How does that work? I oh, mean, I don't get wonderful, it. wonderful. I think part of it is because we're like two ships in the night. And so it kind of was like, we, 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 we're still really excited about one another. We really are. <laughs> That's great. He'd better be. <laughs> now, did he start the nickname Shaw? Your name is Charlene. No, no, no. I really believe, and Karen Keave Hawaii and I were trying to figure out when I became Shaw. The kids in the housing never ever called me Charlene. I don't think they could say the R, I'm telling you. I was always Charlene, okay? So then I think some reporter first said Shaw. And so she asked me one day, how the heck did you become Shaw? I said, I don't know, but doesn't that sound exotic? <laughs> hey, hey, you know, I'll take it.
Shaw was a 19-year-old hula dancer who, with Jack Thompson, built Tihati Productions into one of the largest and longest-running entertainment businesses in Hawaii, with Polynesian reviews and customized events on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii Island. You're, you're graduating from Farrington. Yes. Big achievement. Yes. Then what? Then I traveled the world. I was a dancer, you know, for HVB, for whomever. And I that traveled. came easily because people saw you dance and said, oh, let's hire her. Yeah. I mean, I would latch on to groups. I was with the, the original Puka Puka Otea group that Elaine Frisbee from, from uh, Rarotonga ran, and we were the only one in the state to do Polynesian everything. And then when she was leaving, I was her lead dancer, and she simply said, here, take it and run. And at 19, excuse me, I knew nothing about business. Um, and so, you know, we, when I married my husband and I was working in medical records at Queens Medical Center and he was working in reservations at Hawaiian Airlines and, and um, people started calling us. And I'm telling you, we, it was so successful because tourism at the time was the thing and everybody wanted a show. What, what year was that? What general, what general decade? 1969. Mm -hmm. 70, and if you said you were from Hawaii, that sold. You almost didn't have to do anything. And so we started traveling around the world, and, and when we came home, people wanted shows. We actually had to decide, we gotta get off stage. You cannot be producer, director, business manager, choreographer, which is what we did all, and oh God, try to do the books, hello. <laughs> you dance, what did your husband do? He was the MC. Yeah, and he didn't, his very first um, uh, thing to do was he came to Canada when I was with the World's Fair and I was a dancer and he was one of the few Polynesians who could speak English. So when our MC got sick, he said, give it to Thompson. And he said, I'm not an entertainer, you know, and, and in fact, d just before we left, he said, I'm part Samoan, surely I can learn the knife dance. I always thought he was too <laughs> handsome to be a knife dancer. He didn't look as <laughs> wild and savagery, but he learned it and um, became a knife dancer, terrible knife dancer in the beginning. Can't hold a candle next to my son, who's a, who's a, who's a world holder, a title holder. Uh, but that's how we started. We, we had to get off stage and, and get a good attorney, get a great uh, CPA, and we started, we, we gave up our careers to run the business. Well, you were singled out to be the one to take over the dancing troupe. Yes. Why? You know, I wonder if because I was always so shucks, I was always vocal. I always had an opinion, I wonder. And, and many of the Polynesian girls were more um, reserved. They didn't, they didn't always, I always had the plan. I always had the plan. And it was a good plan? It was a good plan. I think survival mode, always in a survival mode, you know. And, and I think that's what my children detect. Like, Mom, oh, you know, I always plan for tomorrow and I'll save, you know, the rainy day is coming and, and, and always dress well if you get into an accident and make sure you have <laughs> clean underwear. And, and, you know, the house must be, the house must be clean. Visitors would come, they'll judge us. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I was being judged, always. Now, you were busy negotiating contracts and running shows and, and uh, running a, a tight operation, including uh, shows that went around the world yes. in different places abroad. You're also having children. Yes. My punadia in Waimanalo helped raise my children. And, and it was a place where um, they were always clean and always well fed and always happy. And I could rest assured that they weren't missing me the way uh, other children would miss their parents that would have to take trips a lot because we'd always be on the phone and, and she was like, don't worry, mama be home, mama be home soon and whatever. And she was the stabling force and the reason I could travel the way I did. You know, somehow I don't see you handing off most of your business and most of your child care to other people. I just don't <laughs> see that. I did, I took care of them even though I traveled. Um, a lot of times they would travel with me and I'm telling you, if I was, I, my youngest son was about six weeks when I went back on stage, and I had him in a little basket back of the stages in Chicago or New York or, or uh, Washington, D.C. I, I did. I took my children with me. I you did. gave birth to five, mm -hmm. and then you ended up with seven more somehow? Yeah. It's a Polynesian custom. 
and when I say Hanai, I raise them from three weeks old. I don't only take the ones that, you know. Are almost ready to go. Yeah, almost ready. <laughs> no, no, I've, and that's why the line between my natural children and my Hanai children pales because they're all brothers and sisters. They never say, oh, this is my Hanai brother or this is my Hanai sister. They're brothers and sisters, you know. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because till today, everybody comes home for Kongai, you know. That's a Sunday afternoon meal uh, right after church. Everybody's there and everybody's talking at the same time. And it's amazing. We all know what everybody's saying. Sundays are great for us. Shaw Thompson, who's been recognized as Hawaii Mother of the Year, clearly loves her family and her community. Among the many boards on which she has agreed to serve, the Hawaii Tourism Authority and the Honolulu Police Commission. People started taking us seriously when we, when we would sit on business boards or when we contributed in a, in a business fashion. You know, but yeah, I mean, you're Polynesian, surely you can't be too smart and entertainment heavens, you must fool around and you must do drugs. Well, we did neither and, and, and it paid off, it paid off for us. I sense you're a good negotiator. I'm trying to figure out what your style is. <laughs> it's the Pake blood, <laughs> Leslie, it's the Chinese blood. And the funny thing about it is in entertainment, they will say, oh, come and put on a show or oh, come and sing and dance for us and you can eat all you want and you can drink. I don't drink. Um, I'm really thin. I don't eat that much. I need something else. And money was the thing I needed. And but we had to earn it. We had to earn it. They didn't take us seriously, you know. Um, yeah, my my kids are a little luckier because they've had the benefit of our stories, and they went in with degrees, so they they know that they can they can handle it. And 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 we expect for them. To, to give back. We, we always say in our family, and we were honored by a high school for this, much is expected from whom much is given. And man, nobody in our clan, nobody would ever start to begin to think that maybe they were owed this or maybe they're kind of special and so, uh-uh, we make fun of everything and then we'd take them down. You, you know, that wouldn't happen in our family. So everybody's expected to do housework. Oh, and my, no, no my breaks. My son, who um, has a real thriving career on his own, he fronted for uh, 50 cent, 50 cent. Afatia. For Afatia for 50 cents. And I mean, I remember him, uh, he was June Jones' first running back and won a ring and, you know, all state, all star. And excuse me, by Saturday morning, that kennel better be clean because we don't have a yard man that's going to clean the kennel. And he used to do it and he'd say, oh, mom, can't you get, you know, I got to be at rehearsal and I got, yeah, we can, but, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour, do your stuff first. And, and that's the way it is. I expected that of them. And, you know, I'm really grateful that they're great kids. I know you brought in some major acts and yes. you developed major talent. I think we're known as a Polynesian review. And I don't know that many people know that Tihati Productions has a vast department that brings in contemporary acts. Um, like we brought in Lionel Richie and Cindy Lauper. And we also do thematic parties. You know, we'll, we'll prepare a whole Raiders of the Lost Ark or um, Aloha in a volcano. So we do many things, but I think they still think of me as the hula girl. I mean, maybe because they'll all say, oh, you know, you, you run that halal. And I say, no, I'm not a kumu. I, I don't have a halal, but Tihati Productions, they think of as, as a Polynesian review. You've had to really strike a balance between Polynesian mm -hmm. authenticity mm -hmm. and entertainment. How, how have you worked that out? I decided early on not to educate them, rather to entertain them, but to not sell myself and not give them what is real. Any Tihati review uh, that you see will have real flowers, we'll use real tea leaf skirts, we do authentic numbers and sing it in the native tongues, you know, Tahitian, Samoan, Fijian, um, and, and a lot of my instructors are from those islands, uh, Hawaiian. Um, so I never felt that uh, tourism was a threat to me. In fact, um, when some people might have thought, oh, that's a sellout. She's worked in Waikiki for 35 years. You know, why isn't she with us? I will say, well, Tourism Dollar sent all my kids to college. And I never felt that I wasn't doing exactly what is me. You know, I believe God gave me a gift in my roots and my heritage, and I share it. And lucky for me, uh, tourism is Hawaii's number one industry. And they'll always need the hula girl and the steel guitar and the fire knife dancer. And so... I think I'm here to stay. 
lucky for Shaw Thompson, will always need the hula girl. And lucky for us, she is here to stay. Mahalo piha to Shaw Thompson for sharing stories with me. And mahalo to you for joining in this week and every week for Long Story Short on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Surround yourself with people that can do things that you can't, because there's always things that you can do that they can't do. And, and then you get the completed circle, you know. But I have to say that for me, and, and just finishing college now, I, I realize that a lot of people do not take, um, take God into consideration. For me, without that, man, I'd be a basket case. That was, that, that's what I held on to. I said, lead me, guide me, take me. And that's the only thing that I follow. I'm kind of bossy and I think I can do many things and I, and I have a hard time not being the one to make the plan or to organize. But, but yeah, I can follow the scriptures. I can follow you, God. You defer to God. I do, I do, <laughs> all the time.